Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Let's start with some macro thoughts. Here's your Powell cheat guide. Now go to lunch, Jonathan Farrow tells us. And then Powell's hawkish testimony, markets now price three and a half hikes this year, following hawkish remarks, up from 3.3 hikes. Um, I think we're going to move towards four. Um, Powell's hawkish testimony raised the possibility that the Fed could rethink its plan for three rate hikes this year and potentially add a fourth. So let's see how that plays out. Bitcoin volatility, take a look, it's really quite extraordinary and speaks to the millennial stomach, which is obviously quite brave. Home thoughts, it is with very heavy hearts we share with you the tragic loss of Willie, the founder and owner of Sericoi Lodge. I had the privilege of staying in Sericoi Lodge and I interviewed William Roberts, Willie, um, and he described to me this extraordinary journey from the shores of Lake Baringo. One point he hid in Kakamega Forest and learned how to hunt birds and all sorts of things. And eventually he settled in Lewa and, and built Sericoi Lodge. And if you've got time, do have a listen. May his soul rest in peace. That time we visited Sericoi Lodge, we also flew with tropic air to Ololokwe. And I took this photograph from the top of Ololokwe, and if you're interested, follow that helicopter ride. There's also a video of it, um, a helicopter ride to Mount Ololokwe for breakfast. Still sticking with Abdul Razak Gurno and his book Paradise, the, one, the way one story contains many and how they belong not to us, but are part of the random currents of our time, and about how stories capture us and entangle us for all time. Abdul Razak Gurna's fiction grows out of desertion. His novels are haunted by abandonment as characters rupture ties, not only with their homelands, but with loved ones and their own sense of identity. His fictional territory is Africa, and he expertly traces how political fissures reverberate into the minute details of personal relationships. Desertion treads much of the same ground, reworking Gurna's perennial themes, racial tensions, the forging of identity, belonging and rejection, and competing versions of the truth. His first non novel, Memory of Departure, trawled through the alleyways of an old East African coastal town. Desertion opens in a small town along the coast from Mombasa with the tale of how, in 1899, a man appeared there at dawn like a figure out of myth. Will Knocker has been traveling up north. This is the road to the northern frontier district. And this is the Jade Sea, both I will knock at. Final home thought, surfers in Lebanon face threat trash waves. Florida poll Rubo's, Rubio's approval rating hits an all-time low, 38% or thereabouts. And I tweeted, Marco Rubio gets youth quaked. Youth quake defined as a significant cultural, political, or social change arising from the actions or influence of young people was selected by the Oxford Dictionary as the 2017 word of the year. I wrote about this when I said the youth vote slept in during Brexit, then woke up for the UK snap election, then nearly carried Jeremy Corbyn into 10 Downing Street. From there, I go back to Turgenev in First Love, O oh, youth, youth, and you go your way heedless, uncaring, as if you own all the treasures of the world, and even grief elates you, even sorrow sits well upon your brow. You are self-confident and insolent, and you say, I alone am alive, behold, 
even while your own days fly past and vanish without trace and without number, and everything within you melts away like wax in the sun, like snow, and perhaps the whole secret of your enchantment lies not indeed in your power to do whatever you may will, but in your power to think that there is nothing you will not do, it is this that you scatter to the winds, gifts, which you could never have used to any other purpose. Each of us feels most deeply convinced that he has been too prodigal of his gifts, that he has a right to cry, oh, what could I not have done if only I had not wasted my time? Z's power grab means China is vulnerable to the whims of one man. This is the Financial Times. It has long been evident that China's Xi Jinping would not, indeed could not, step down from power. He has made too many enemies, particularly through his anti-corruption campaign, even if he wanted to go, which seems unlikely. Yet the announcement the two-term limit to the presidency is to go is still shocking. What seemed likely is now a fact. Mr. Z has discarded the attempt by Deng Xiaoping to institutionalize checks on the power of China's leaders, itself a reaction to the wild excesses of the era of Mao Zedong. What is it re-emerging is strongman rule, a concentration of power in the hands of one man, it now looks a bit like Putinism with Chinese characteristics. Um, in, in China Rising, that piece I wrote in August, I was talking about how the world, uh, how Putin was uh, refused to be rolled over in the Ukraine, drew a line in the sand, and one of the collateral consequences of that was to send President Putin into the ready embrace of Xi Jinping. And I was saying then, in fact, far from being a unipolar world, we have entered a bipolar or even tripolar world, US, China, and Russia. So Putinism with Chinese characteristics is not such a surprise when you look at it through that geopolitical prism. The extreme event continues to unfold in the high Arctic today in response to a surge of moisture and warmth 2018 is well exceeding previous year's thin lines for the month of February. 2018 is the red line. It speaks to global warming and what I was saying in November 2015, that we are all frogs in boiling water. We have created, in my opinion, massive interference with the cosmic fine-tuning phenomenon. Jared Kushner has access to top-secret intelligence withdrawal. Surprising it took so long. Jared Kushner, says the New Yorker, was their lucky charm, the former National Security Council member said about China's view of the president's son-in-law. Was a dream come true. They couldn't believe he was so compliant. This is from Ronald Klein. My guess is that is the white lie. Ivanka Trump, I believe my father, I know my father. So I think I have that right as a daughter to believe my father. Welcome to Dubai 2.0, building by building. Sarah Alamiri watched Dubai rise into the sky as she grew up in the city. She's now a government minister overseeing the next stratospheric leap of mission to Mars. The quest for the new thing, though, masks an uncomfortable truth. As Dubai comes of age, the city has no choice but to reinvent itself again or risk a severe reversal of fortunes. Wealthier neighbors are trying to replicate its effort to move beyond oil. International banks are retrenching and it's losing some of its allure for foreign workers. The trick is to avoid the same kind of debt fuel spending overdrive that brought the Emirate to the brink of default in 2009. After pursuing the biggest, tallest, and glitziest, it's now all about the smartest. Dubai wants to make technology, research, and development the cornerstones of the economy. A very interesting article worth listening to. I wrote something in February 14 when I said Dubai is the real transit state, a connection point in an interconnected century. 
Tokyo believes Russia is boosting its military activity near Japan. At Valdai, a rare public appearance by Nia Rosen, who explains how the U.S. commitment to regime change in Syria has isolated their Kurdish allies and how the Kurds are at the center of any realistic plan to resolve the crisis. International markets U.S. consumer confidence rises to its highest since November 2000. In the last 50 years, it's only been higher twice, 1968 to 1969, just before the 1969-70 recession, and 1998 to 2000, just before the dot-com crash and subsequent recession. Let's move on to the currency markets. The euro is at 122.08 dollar index, pushing up towards 1950, 19.42 last I checked. Dollar yen 107.19, the Swiss franc 0.9400, the pound 138.77, the Australian dollar 0.7800, India rupee 65.105, South Korean won 1083.16, the real 325.16, Egyptian pound 17.6345, South African rand 1173.16. That's backed up a little bit. Dollar index, this is a chart by Holger. Um, I expect it to move higher now. Euro dollar, this is a chart from T Commodity. Came off a big figure yesterday. Um, we're now at 122, just above. Um, if we drop through here, we're gonna, we could reverse down to below 120. The Bank of Japan announced that it was cutting purchases of bonds due in more than 25 years by 10 billion Yen did not really affect the market. Dollar yen market were lost at 107.19. The 2017 return was equivalent to 131 billion dollars, or 13 percent. This is the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, um, owning on average 1.4 percent of the world's listed stocks. The fund largely follows indices, but has leeway for some active management. Uh, the 13.7% return last year was generated in a year characterized by the biggest stock market boom in eight years. Biggest investments in 2017 were Apple, Nestle, Royal Dutch, Shell. Let's move on to the commodity market. Crude oil futures settled at $63.01, down 1.41% yesterday and fall further to $62.72 last Take a look at this chart from T Commodity. He thinks it's rolled over. Gold, last trading um, at 1317. This is a six month chart. But look at this soybean meal. That's had an outstanding run higher. This chart is from Peter Brandt. A sub Saharan African market, ZEC, said in terms of the law, elections must be held between July the 31st and August the 31st unless Parliament is dissolved earlier in terms of the Constitution. But when I looked um, at this morning, it seems as if the lady in charge of the Z ZEC has been relieved of her duties. Investors pilot debt sales by rare sovereign borrowers. The world's riskiest countries are selling debt at a record rate. Research published late last year found with junk-rated borrowers comprising nearly half of all borrowing from emerging markets in 2017. One advisor called it a gold rush. This month, Nigeria sold $2.5 billion in dollar-denominated debt. Kenya raised $2 billion. Belarus raised $600 million. This comes after EM borrowers raised over $150 billion in syndicated bond sales in January according to Deal Logic, 15% higher than the previous annual record for the start of the year. One of the most fundamental things we're looking for is an improving structural trend, political and regulatory stability, reliable institutions at Andrew Frudenell. When looking at a bond sale or initial public offering, if the main finance minister guy doesn't do much talking and it's all being done by the banker and a slightly speedy investor relations guy, then we know what's going on here. They may give you a whole load of information at the launch, but that could be the last time you hear from them. 
Ultimately, this is people's pensions we're talking about. So one investor, if you explain to the man on the street that the pension fund is being invested in Nigeria at 7%, they would be incredulous. If you threw that decision out to ordinary people, would they buy it? Probably not. As you know, the government of Kenya sold $2 billion worth of euro bonds last week. 5th of February, I wrote, emerging and frontier market borrowers surely need to get their skates on and pull the trigger real quick on any borrowing that they had been considering for this year. Moody's affirms Ethiopia's B1 rating maintains a stable outlook, saying political tensions could have a more negative and long-lasting impact on growth and FDI inflows than Moody's currently expects, <coughs> which would heighten Ethiopia's external vulnerability very strong growth potential. Moody projects that real GDP growth will exceed 8% over the next few years after an estimated 10% growth in 2016-2017. Assumes that the social tensions and anti-government protests will have a limited impact on the economy. Um, FDI reached $4.1 billion in 2016-2017, a 27.6% increase compared to the previous year, or around 5.8% of GDP. Banking system is growing rapidly. Um, investments in large infrastructure continue to support growth. Central government debt is low at around 27% of GDP in 2017. However, Ethiopia's investment is in large part undertaken by state-owned enterprises and debt financed. As a result, public sector debt has risen more rapidly than the economy to 59% of GDP at the end of June 2017. Um, and saying all the unrests of the most serious in Ethiopia's recent history have resulted in the tragic loss of life and property. While the economy has been broadly resilient so far, the political situation remains a source of credit risk for Ethiopia should heighten social and political tensions have a material and long-lasting negative impact on investment and availability of external financing. Um, and then talking about structural US dollar shortages in the private sector, which has been a perennial problem. October 2016, I was writing about the first state of emergency, and I said then that the government needs to change tack and effect a course correction. And history shows us that this course correction is one of the most difficult things to pull off. I quoted Kapuczynski in that article, you don't understand a thing. I'm not writing, so the details add up. The point is the essence of the matter. Minister Chinamasa has seen meeting officials working on Zimbabwe at the Foreign and Colonial Office, Commonwealth Office yesterday. The bottom line, this is a tweet from Ed Manangagwa, the president, the bottom line is an economy which is back on its feet, he says. Not yet Ramaphosa. Africa Confidential, the new cabinet lineup shows signs of a fraught balancing of ANC factional interests. Maybe Ramaphosa's first cabinet, but it was not all of his making. South African oil shares down 0.8% so far this year. Dollar versus Rand, the Rand backed up a little bit, I think some disappointment with the cabinet. Gupta Empire crumbles in wake of Zuma's departure. That was always expected. The corporate logo on the deserted plot in a grim industrial park near Johannesburg is broken. At the front, a two-let sign hints at a business in decay. A solitary second security guard emerges and orders a visitor to leave the premises of Sahara Computers. And uh, describing the political power of the Guptas has been eliminated. They are totally exposed at the moment, says Ben Theron, Chief Operating Officer of Uta. The empire is imploding at a very rapid rate. The Egyptian pound 17.6345. Nigeria's economic growth rate rose to 1.9% year on year in the fourth quarter from 1.4% in quarter three. GDP grew 0.8% for 2017 as a whole versus a contraction of 1.6% in 2016. Nigerian all shares up 10.61% year to date. The Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index is a world beater and is up 29.28% year to date. Kenya's government spent $532 million on elections last year after a disputed presidential vote spurred a rerun and additional outlay. It's practically crazy.
criminal. Co-op Bank gets a 15.2 billion shilling facility from the IFC for small firms. Co-op Bank has rallied 8.75% so far this year. Take a look at the share price data. The link is on Rich Wrap Up. ShopRite to make a Kenya market entry by the year end, uh, filling the competition vacuum and buoyed by a 5.5% GDP growth forecast for 2018. Starting last year, the retailers in Kenya were in total disarray. And we were able to secure seven summits and leases. The shilling fell as low as 100.8 earlier in February. Uh, but we're now at 101.604. Nairobi all shares up 5.54% so far this year. The NSE 20 is up 0.62% so far this year. The National Treasury through the Central Bank has reopened two 15-year bonds, 2010 and 2013, seeking 27 billion shillings in a tap sale with the yields of 12.676% and 12.906%. Unger reported first half uh, earnings per share surged to 257.377%. The share price is the best performing one at the Nairobi Stock Exchange. It's up 43.1% year to date. Turnover climbed 8.1%. Operating profit up 314.35%. Profit before tax up 282.935%. EPS was up a whopping 257.377%. In their commentary, animal nutrition volumes increased by 20%, supported by a stable supply of raw material that ensured continuous supply during the period of drought. Human nutrition volumes declined by 4%. New product lines, pulses, rice and fish feed continue to show growth. Selling and admin expenses increased in the period compared to the prior year, mainly as a consequence of increased provisions for doubtful debts in the FMCG business. Bakery business is working to recover its market presence. New wheat meal project underway in El Barret. Current sluggish demand for wheat and maize products may negatively impact volumes and profitability in the second half. I concluded by saying, well, well. The offer by Seaboard dated the 22nd of February on rich ramp ups, if you want to go and look at it again, has to be improved. And hence the share price is already trading above that price of 40 shillings. Um, and they're going to have to improve that. East African Porter and Cement reported first half earnings per share was negative 10 shillings and 55 cents, an outcome which was 334% worse than the previous term. Revenue was down 17.731%. Um, operating income, other operating income was up. I'm not sure what they did there. Uh, profit before tax down 114.6%. Profit after tax down 290.766%. Earnings per share was 334% worse off. They said revenue declined by 18% due to slow market uptake on account of prolonged political activity which dampened investment decisions and thus slowed down economic activities. Further impacted by knock-on effects of interest rates capping and prolonged drought, increases in cost of coal and unit cost of electricity, gross profit margin declined from 18% in the prior period to just 5%. Given that the company has enormous resources in the form of idle and fully mined parcels of land, board expects to be granted the necessary approvals to generate value from these ideal parcels of land. Which leads me to the conclusion it's a real estate play now. Once again, thank you kindly for stopping.